Hi, Jean. Nice How to you see you. Yeah, you too. You're looking very fine in your hat. Thank you. Congratulations on your new book. Thank you. 1982. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Creek Wilder. That's right. Orwell's That's right. dystopian nightmare. I didn't think it could be done. Orwell missed. He, but you told, did it. He left out the two years before. I'm filling it in. Absolutely. Okay, I haven't read it. Um, <laughs> thanks, Court. Uh, this is an interesting residency. Let's start with what you've been doing the last couple of uh, days. And I saw you last night. I mean, that social media has been uh, going crazy over this. News of your concert, or, or I guess concerts, in downtown Kensington Market here in Toronto. I mean, you guys have been playing select gigs throughout the summer at festivals and 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 uh, larger venues. What does it feel like to, to be doing a street side, side pub right now? Um, well, on a personal level, it struck me. We started on Sunday during a, um, a Sunday in Kensington Market, their last one of the summer where no cars are allowed in Kensington Market. And uh, it struck me that I've lived in Toronto now longer than I have in Kingston. So, uh, and I was very grateful to play there. It just struck me uh, how great Toronto is and how much I love it here. And I was a streetcar right away, and we played that show. So first and foremost, that was great. And then, um, you know, on other levels, it feels great to connect with people, you know? I think, yeah. I, I mean, I was watching you last night, and the romance of it anyway would be to say, seeing you do stadiums, there's a divide between you and the audience. I mean, you're trying to connect, but they're behind a barrier, and there's thousands and thousands of them and last night they're kind of right in your face there's you know 200 people crammed up against the romance would be to say that that that's uh there's something attractive for you about that after the more uh, more impersonal nature of stadiums would that be true yeah but i mean the romance is always there um you know agility is what i think we go for to be agile and that was thrust upon us you know because you can't pick your stages necessarily you know, and the small stages come to us all eventually. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you want to be able to play on the ass of an elephant if you could. And so we can. And uh, in that situation last night, you know, and this music requires it. I mean, you know, I think uh, my last verse to the guys before going on stage is, okay, top of a mountain top, top, you know. <laughs> but, you know, wind blowing in your hair. And uh, so it seems to be what's required. Agility is what we go for. How do you um, prepare for agility? How do you accomplish agility? Well, I think, you know, in life, again, you know, um, been at this long enough to disseminate, you know, the practical from the mystical, you just be prepared. And when you're prepared, then you can go off in any direction you want because you're secure knowing that you prepared for that even, that contingency. <clears throat> so that's what we're doing with this Kensington market. Um, thing we're doing um you know i mean virginia wolf said the world will not pay for what it does not want mm -hmm. you know which i think you know it is an issue in the business and illegal downloading and different culprits have been named but you know maybe the fun's gone out of it a bit sam snyderman said as much mm. on his way out sam the record man said he might as well be selling fridges refrigerators you know and i just thought that was he'd said that years ago um, and that's sad, you know, given what he did for the business and how he was in the business. And it wasn't just one thing. He was moving music. It was this idea, music is something you want to be. Again, like Alan Arkin. And, you know, it's not something you want to do. That. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, and I think... But just, just, just on this point for a second before, <clears throat> I didn't actually mean to be squatting on this on one part of the conversation, but it's, it's interesting. So is, is the agility more attractive when it's a special event in Canada where you know you have a gazillion fans and so a hundred tons of people are trying to get into this thing and it's a surprise gig at a storefront, uh, as opposed to um, somewhere in middle Europe where only 50 people turn up and you're playing a small bar because they don't know the tragic leap as well. Well, there's a lot of allure in this business too, you know, and challenge is a big one. Expectation isn't as fun, meeting expectations, which can happen with the hip a lot. Um, you come out, you swing the big mallet and hit the thing and the thing goes up and rings the bell, thing, <laughs> and you're supposed to do that. And that can be um, different, um, meeting expectations, but going out there and trying to, to rise to a challenge, playing in front of an unknown audience, like a bunch of known unknowns, you know, is a real challenge and it's real punk rock and I love it. And I love that about last night and I've loved that recently, you know, this idea that you can still challenge people. And um, 
there's lots of material there to challenge them with. When you say ringing the big bell, what 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 do you think about immediately? That tragically hip has to go. The, the, the expectation of the, the mallet and the big bell. What, what is that? One of well, the hit songs from Fully Completely. What, what, what would you know? On a personal level, you know, means me ripping off my head and booting it around like a soccer ball, right? And then uh, drinking coconut milk from it with everybody afterwards. Um, I don't know. Some crazy. I get some crazy notions over the years. And again, it's just the practical way of just tinkering with my show a little bit mm. and saying, you know, I'm gonna just stand and deliver and I'm gonna sing these songs and I'm gonna really, 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 really sing them, inhabit them. I'm not gonna do adultery scream because <clears throat> I don't do them before 10 a.m. Uh, <laughs> but, it, you know, that's what I want to do. That's where I wanna go. And, um, and sure enough, there's a lot of power there and a lot of material and a lot that challenges yeah. yeah, it was it was interesting watching you guys last night because I was thinking they're really putting out for this. They're really going for it. They're really, you know, giving it all they've got. And then I was thinking, I've never seen them not do that. You guys have to, you seem to have one speed on stage, which is, guys, we got to go. Mm. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, you only want to serve the songs. And these in particular, I just thought even recording them, you know, and Gavin Brown, big help with that. But just leave nothing on the table. Really let it all out. Don't conserve. And you can find yourself doing that inadvertently. And was that a particular game plan for this record? I mean, just to bring it back to the record which comes out today. So it's been three years since you were here talking about the last Tragically Hip release. Uh, that was the Bob Rock produced platinum selling album, We Are The Same. That was a record that somewhat Gord pushed the limits of the Tragically Hip sound with the orchestral arrangements, a three-song depression suite. People are calling this the back to basics effort. Do you see it that way? You're smiling. No. Well, it uh, it is in practice in that we, um, and again, helping the emotional quotient of the singing and the band, we spent three years uh, learning our songs, getting to know them, starting very basic voice, melody, uh, McCartney, Lennon, and then building the songs from there, but uh, knowing our songs well before we started singing them. And by hook or by crook or because of coincidence or different things that infiltrated the, the life of our family, and the band is a big family, um, things get put on hold and pushed back a bit. And it forced us to really know the songs. And we went in and booted them out in 10 days here in Parkdale mm. and at Noble Street Studios. Pretty much live off the like floor. Like kids do, yeah. you know, like we did. Like you learn all your songs for a year and a half, and then you go in with two days of studio time that your uncle is loaning you. Mm. And you really you and you record forty two songs in two days. I mean that's what you do. So in this sense, this record has that, and it goes with what we need, what I needed emotionally, personally, to happen, which is just a, a blown out voice uh, with everything it's got. Why did you need that to happen emotionally? I think the content, the you know what the record is. A lot of it was uh, a good half. The songs are very visceral. I asked the guys to give me, you know, five ideas each from your cupboards and let me just be attracted to the one that attracts me. You know, let the singer sing lyrics to the one that jazzes him. Mm. And they totally let me do that, not to be the arbiter of good taste, but just because of faith and trust, which is, again, for a band 25 years in, it's still something you're always working at. And you always admire when you see it, faith and trust. So... They let me do that, and I would uh, react viscerally, spontaneously, improvisationally to a piece of music, Man Machine Poem, 20 minutes, mm. which doesn't make me a heck of a guy or it a heck of a song. But it does but suggest that this really is cathartic for you. This is like a, um, this is working out emo emotional and physical exercises for you to, when you say, I just wanted to get in there and bash out the songs with my voice. Yeah, I wanted it all to match up sort of visceral and not uh, over-intellectualizing. And, and, you know, again, improvisation can sometimes um, be better than, than how it was written, you know? It can deceive the intellect, the creative power there, they say. That song we played off the top, At Transformation, by some accounts that was the most effortless track to record on this record, and, and fans seem to be certainly responding to it. Does, it. does it still catch you by surprise, Gord, when those lightning-in-a-bottle moments happen in studio? Uh, yeah, yeah. Entirely, and on stage, and you know, and these songs, it, it sounds cliche, but they are just sort of, we're playing them now. We played Modern Spirit for the first time yesterday, and it jumped forward into its rightful spot as sort of a jam, stones, attitudinal, swaggering song. 
that it just, I mean, it's great on the record, folks, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it just needed that extra, I don't know what you call it, a chromosome. If you reference the Stones, does that make you Jagger? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 oh, no. Um, uh, I was going to say, I, no, I'm Keith, because everyone's always like, no, I'm Keith. <laughs> I'm Keith. I'm Keith. Uh, but no one wants to be sounds. Keith anymore <laughs> after that book. The, what? I love that book. Come on. You didn't like that? Wow, well, come on. <laughs> Their job is to show people. You make art as a group. Your job is to show people it's awesome. Mm. What are the people in the UN supposed to think if the Stones can't do it? <laughs> you know, how are people, teachers and people, ambulance drivers doing, you know, life and death work? If the Stones can't do it, he has an obligation. He should have said, yeah, whatever. <laughs> he gave too much of himself for you. You prefer the mystery. Well, yeah. 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 600 pages. Uh, yeah. I just don't, like your Keith Richards, not bitter. No, no, no. This doesn't all lead to bitterness, does it? <laughs> your person, it's a personal no. affront. Uh, so uh, yeah, let me let, let me ask you something about that Paul Langlois, uh, your buddy in the in the band, your guitarist, uh, one of your guitarists, said uh, recently um, in the lead up to this record. Uh, you guys haven't done a lot of interviews, but he did say, "We just have to do what we do. It's hard enough to please the five of us, let alone fans that may feel we're playing too much old or too much new." So, Gord, as time goes on, is it harder or easier for the band to agree on what you like? On what I no Gord on, like? on what the five of you. Uh, Oh, please so, the five of us, as he said. Yeah. Well, somehow we get it done, and it always changes, and there's no sort of manifesto or uh, manual we can consult. Um, you know, although uh, I've tried to write it many times, um, but we somehow get it done. You know, last night we were really uh, bothered over the final five songs we were going to do because we knew you were coming, and we wanted it to be <laughs> something else. So the real thing was, do we repeat three not, songs we've done earlier nice. in the day? These three, you know, block rockers we did earlier in the day, and we've never repeated in a day songs. And I brought that up, and it wouldn't sit still, a piece of hair that wouldn't lie flat. It's like, guys, we never, we don't repeat songs. And it was like, oh, but it'll be a super set for Gian. <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, I like Gian too, but we never repeat. And they just it came up all of a sudden, you know, and we, anyway. We um, decided not to repeat, so we did five songs we hadn't done, uh, which doesn't make us a heck of a band. And uh, but, you know, I guess it doesn't make you a heck of a guy either. Thank you. Uh, it, it was it was a tremendous five songs. It was exhilarating. Thanks. And and, and it was a combination of uh, I think you played three new ones, and 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 then you played uh, um, music of work, and you played um, uh, Bob Cajun, and mm. and on Bob Cajun. See, I was saying at transformation. Um, it sounds like the kind of a stream of consciousness about a state of being. I mean, you're you're known for improvising while performing live, and I was going to ask you if you approach songwriting that way, or if it's a more premeditated affair for you. And then it was interesting last night because Bob Cajun, which is this sort of you know has become kind of an iconic Canadian song now. You you said in the intro to it last night. You know, I wrote this uh, somewhere between this street and this street on on the way to a Baskin and Robbins. Sorry to disappoint you all. And, and it seemed like what you were getting at was this isn't some magic, you know, mystical process that I, I labor over sometimes. Sometimes the lyrics just come to me, and yet there are many of us around the world who will look at them and pine them, uh, over them and, and wonder about them for, for years after that. Is that an interesting juxtaposition for you? Well, I mean, you take them however you can get them, right? So Bob Cajun, Constellation, Constellation came to me, yeah, walking with my then newborn first daughter from Baskin-Robbins up Carlisle Avenue. Um, you know. Um, and, yeah, you take it how you can get it. This record, you know, uh, I labored over things, and I didn't like the ones I labored over as much. They bothered me and made me angry and made me want to not do it. And... Um, and then the ones that I responded to viscerally, again, like Man, Machine, Poem, I really just, it's, it was there, and I really liked it. I thought it was a perfect little poem of love and devotion and gratitude. Um, you know, and while being taking responsibility for, you know, being a machine, the machine of the Man, Machine, Poem. And um, so I really liked that. And I don't, you know, probably just because, 
And the ones you work over more, you get more into why am I doing this? Why, why do I even care? Do I care about this? You know, but I wanted to care about everything I said on this record. And, uh, you know, maybe, the, and the, you know, yeah, emotionally, I wanted to mean it. And uh, I don't know what that means. In, in contrast to the past? Well, I mean, never, because I don't really remember the past. I don't uh, spend a lot of time right. thinking about it. It doesn't do me much good right. uh, when, I'm doing my, when I'm doing this. I mean, these uh, notebooks, I, you know, I just kind of fill them up and I go to the last thing first. But when you say, I wanted to mean it, is that a different emotion from the way you've always felt as a writer? I've wanted to mean it always, but sometimes you get caught up in the, the stagecraft of it or something, you know? And again, it's just this sort of running back and forth between your head and your heart, your intellect, your creative power, and you know, and um, you're wanting to impress or something, and you can get caught up in that, you know, uh, worshiping the intellect, you know, which is just uh, which will eat you up. We want to be it. Seems to be a love song about staying together. Mm -hmm. So is that is that, would I be right on that? I think so. Yeah, I mean, the verses would say, you know, and again, last night I just concocted this couple, Derek and Cheryl, uh, the midway of Oktoberfest. And um, so I see that when I, you know, baby, when you get so wrecked? I just like that one, you know, talking to her glass-eyed boyfriend. And, um, but the we want to be it, we don't, uh, we don't want to do it, we want to be it comes from um, Alan Arkin mm. talking about Madeline Kahn mm -hmm. in his book, A Life is a Slim... Slim volume, it's a memoir, great, my great favorite book. kind. Beautiful book. Yeah. yeah, in the foreword, he talks about sitting with her in a moment um, on set somewhere and saying, "Wow, you're a talented actress, singer, pianist, comedian. When did you? What was your primary interest? Was it dance? No. Was it singing? No. Was it acting? You know, which? How do you know what you wanted to do?" And she said, "Well, I listened to a lot of music, and I wanted to be it." And he was totally flummoxed by that. She wanted, but then it all clicked in for him that in fact. That's what he had been trying to do. Yes. To be yes. the music. And um, so he dedicated his memoir for all those people that want to be the music. And yes. I just thought, well, that's very fitting because I think that's what we want to be. Well, uh, he, he, to embody it rather than just to perform it. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is interesting. I, I know you dedicated that song to that, to, to uh, Alan Arkin and Madeline Kahn. And, and um, I sort of made that connection, I assumed, it, and, and it, which is interesting because... You really do look like on stage sometimes when you get lost in the song, or at least we like to think you get lost in the song. Alan I don't Arkin. know. It might it might all be a calculated thing. You want to be Alan Arkin. <laughs> you want. You... I thought it was a menacing Dabney <laughs> Coleman. More no, you, on. you you do. It does seem like you are being the music mm. or aspiring to be the music. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's you know this uh, emotional thing I keep coming back to, but I think I just sort of went as. Uh, with singing, my range and everything, just go as high as I can, just sing as loud and as powerfully as I can because I always know how to get there. That's, you know, that's, it's sort of something I can always remember, just sing with everything you've got. And it actually is very freeing and mm. makes the show actually easier to do and uh, opens me up for challenge as opposed to expectation again. The, some of the, your lyrics are confessional and personal, but they're also often... Um, cryptic, Gord? Is that a way of protecting your own privacy? Um, to take a bit of the you out of it when you when you actually give us the lyrics? Well, that's an ongoing um, conversation. You know, um, working with Bob Rock, for instance, he uh, is a good buddy, and he was very encouraging, and but wanted me to kind of speak clearly, more clearly. You know, and I took that on as a... Again, something that was uh, a certain, it might sound like a limitation or something, but it was sort of freeing. But I got really into that and, and trying to be clear, more clear about things. And, um, but it's not something you can, uh, like an ocean liner, you can't turn it around immediately. Um, and again, with this one, I guess I just thought, <clears throat> I'm maybe not interested in clear or, <clears throat> or um, I'm just not interested in, I, I don't know, I'm interested in how the words make me feel. And... Um, and yeah, and trying to capture them in a certain way, and uh, and then and not screw with them too much, not let my intellect sort of, you know, diminish the creative. <clears throat> I don't know power. That means you can't judge them. 
when you finished writing them, right? You, that, that means when you, you if you if you're going to honor what's just come out, mm. is that hard to do? To look at it and not be not go, eh, I don't like that line, you know. Yeah, I'm gonna get rid of this thing here. I mean, how much of that? But editing? I think that's a combination of just the way you sang it and the, what the words are, and it'd be like, yeah, maybe there's a better word, a more expressive word, a more um, uh, suitable word, but it just sounds great the way it is. And um, yeah, I'd rather not judge them anyway. There's several of the songs on this record cont contain at least one reference to death. Every song. Several, a Several. few of them, yeah. <clears throat> is that something that you're preoccupied by? At, uh, I mean, you're only in your 40s, but, but at, at midlife, is that something that you're thinking about? Well, the game is coming, Gian, and nothing <laughs> can stop court. it. Yes, yes. Ken Dryden. Uh, <clears throat> well, I, you know, it's interesting because the 40s, 40s have been tough, you know. And no one tells you about this. Everyone's just so worried about the 30s. But the 40s are tough because you, you know... You, you're starting to realize, <clears throat> um, yeah, this thing's going to end, you know? But you're still young enough and dumb enough to think you might be able to work out a deal, get your way out of it, you know? You're sort of stuck. And so you're, you know, running and jogging and taking vitamins and, you know, we're really, we're, we're hung up here in our 40s. I'm almost out of them, so, you know. Have, well, have fun with that. I saw. Thank you. I'm, I, 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 you paid a very rosy picture. I, I, um, I saw a comedian. I just think he's the greatest, Louis C.K. Mm -hmm. on on Friday night, and, and he said, "Look, here's the deal. You're it, two things are gonna. One of two things is gonna happen. You're you're either gonna die, or you're gonna get really, really, really old. <laughs> that's that's yeah. the, the the two fates that it, that are ahead for you, Gord Downey. He said. He didn't actually include your name, but well, the sense that he was speaking about you. My mom would say, it's not how we planned it, <laughs> you know, the getting old thing. And I thought, that says it all, Mom. You're right. Speaking of which, um, you guys have been touring for almost 30 years now. And it's almost like you probably have spent more time with the band than you have with your family. And you all have families now. Uh, what's the conversation that happens around trying to balance lives and going, getting back on tour again at this point? Um. Well, I think we're grateful for each other and for our friendship and what it's come through and where it's going and the potential for it, always. And we're really, you know, um, we're good for each other given that we are estranged from our, we become temporarily estranged from our families. Um, but it is very much a big family. We're all integrated now, so torpedo midships to somebody hits us all and, um, you know, and put this record back a little bit, you know, and so I think there'll probably be more of that obviously, where you have to sort of put things aside and rally and help and support. And, um, and that's very, uh, well, it's important and enriching and informative and instructional. And, and, you know, it's family. You know, getting to know you guys a little bit and your infrastructure, it really is a family. And um, the greatest threat to most bands uh, is not crap songs. It's that they can't stay together. Mm -hmm. right? uh, uh, have you... Have you got any insight on, on, on how you guys have democratically been able to um, somehow be on the same page all, all these years? I mean, one guy, you haven't even traded members. You haven't sent, you know, someone to the Oilers. And, or, you know, it's, it's the same players on the ice, right? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, you try everything. You try spite and malice <laughs> and, uh, you know... Um, you know, small-minded, uh, monopolizing, you try tyranny, uh, and ultimately you end up just loving each other. You haven't tried that yet. You could just love each other, which is what it sort of felt like this time. You know, you really haven't tried that one. Just mm. love each other, accept each other. We tried to start this record ourselves, you know, just producing it ourselves, you know. And, um, and we had to sort of abandon that, you know, because, well, we were... <laughs> Yeah, I just said we're, we should be busy just being friends. You know, that's our big preoccupation. That is ultimately what we're selling. People hire bands for parties. You know, they hire singer-songwriters for other things, but bands they want for, you know, for the reasons we talked about. Or to cry to, or, you know, to, it's not To always... show the UN what's possible, mm -hmm. you know. But um, anyway, I lost my train of thought, but... 
I want to I want to get to a song um, called Atahualpiscat on this record, um, and you, uh, the song is called Goodnight Atahualpiscat, which you played last night as well. Before I do that, uh, this this the, the Hip is a band that's that's toured Canada extensively many many times over the years, and is intertwined with the the Canadian identity through the songs you've written. This this song again feels like it's in that category. We've talked about a bit, a bit about this in the past, but is that connection to Canada? Gord, ever a burden at this stage in your songwriting career? No, because again, there's so much material that hasn't been touched on. I mean, aside from the, when you get away from the patriotic, sort of nationalistic cant, uh, you know, you, there's lots there to talk about, and Attawapiskat is one of those things. I mean, this record feels very much like a year in the life, a year in a day, is what I sort of said last night, and because it, it occurred to me. But starting off in the morning, you know, beside your your partner, your lover, and ending up in this faraway place in Attawapiskat with your band, it's mm. like these are the things that the course of my life. But how do you inoc- how about. do you inoculate yourself from the song like this being a, a, the latest press release from mm-hmm. the tragically hip about a, a situation in Canada or something, which I yeah. know you don't intend it to be. The song, yeah, any but song. But I do. That, do you? But I don't. No, but it's a band. The song is about a band showing up in Attawapiskat to play. Good night, you know, good evening, folks. We're the Silver Poets. We're here. No one ever got laid or, you know, telling people what to do, you know, and uh, we're just a band. We're here in our, you know, thousand-mile suits. We're here to play. But Attawapiskat is not on the way, you know. It's, and I, I try to make it like this uh, Chamber of Commerce piece. Oh, Attawapiskat, city by the bay. Diamond Dazzling, you are on your way, Attawapiskat. But they're not on the way. And if it's Canada, then everything's on the way. But it's always a fly-in community. It's always, you'll hear that about Attawapiskat or all these remote communities. It's a fly-in community. And when the place floods, their reaction is, well, we can relocate you. You mean where our ancestors have hunted and fished for thousands of years? And they always want to relocate. That's the answer. You know, and wouldn't the ring of fire and all these incredible resources as Trevor treasure trove of chromite and diamonds and wouldn't it be great if it wasn't for all these pesky little people you know so Attawapiskat says that to me and good night Attawapiskat is you know just to be able to sing it in any town and as if you're a performer getting the name of the town wrong you know you're not in Attawapiskat when someone says Attawapiskat we immediately think of the housing shortage last October that forced many in the First Nation community to live in temporary shelters, some without insulation or plumbing. As you were saying, you performed in the nearby community of Fort Albany with your, your, your band and your friend, the novelist Joseph Borden. What was your first impression, Gord, when, you, when your plane touched down there in February? In Fort Albany? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I've been up there uh, half a dozen times with my son. We usually go up to around Moose River, Moose Factory, and you know, a lot of people up there, a lot of friends. Um, up there, so um, I wasn't too uh, shocked or surprised. Uh, Everyone up there is super welcoming, super nice, super with it, hilarious, you know? They have a lot to teach us, obviously. And I think the real uh, problem here is that we get that reverse, that we have stuff to teach you and give you and do for you, but we could take a lot of lessons from the way they run their communities up there. They take care of each other, and everybody takes care of everyone in the eyes on the street. And um, the way they stretch a buck, because they totally have to. And, you know, I mean, the free market isn't going to take care of these people. It isn't going to fix it. You know, and economics sort of drives or dominates politics. Like we're told, oh, you know, anything, if it affects the economy, is bad. But the free market's not going to fix that place or help our environment. We require our government for that, you know, to take care of the water and the air and the most vulnerable and, you know, the free market's not going to correct that. A head of lettuce is eight bucks up there, mm. you know, so. Um, Do you feel, um, um, because of, the, not, I mean, be, just because of the economic situation, when a head of lettuce is eight bucks, do you feel guilty when you're there as the big rock star band flying in to do a gig? Well, uh, guilty? No, that didn't cross my mind, you know. We uh, came in there with Joseph. He was speaking at the Great Moon Gathering, which they shift from community to community. He was the keynote speaker. <clears throat> he asked me if I'd want to come up with him, and, I, and he said, do you think the hip would come? And I said, let me ask them. Within an hour, everyone got back, and, um, 
and we were thrilled to go up and we'll go, we'll go again. And, um, you know, obviously learned a lot, saw a lot. Mm. Joe, Boy- a lot. Joe Boyden, uh, he's, uh, he's written, we Canadians have, have always been good at ignoring communities like Attawapiskat until desperation pushes them into the headlines. What do you make of that? Well, that's the narrative. That's the only narrative people get. That's a part of the reason Joseph wanted to go up and, uh, and play a rock show, you know, really, to have some fun and sort of build that bridge of communication. Like, so it goes two ways. So people hear the stories of the North and get to know people up there. Um, because, in fact, yeah, if it's called Canada, then <clears throat> everything is on the way, you know. It's not, uh, nothing's too remote. Hmm. I don't, I've got so much I want to talk to you about, and I don't have a lot of time left with you here. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, beyond being a band, the Tragically Hip is a group of friends we've been uh, talking about playing together since you were teenagers. You know, on one of the occasions you were here, you said that the band remains naive in some ways. You were actually talking about the early days, and you said, uh, oh, we were so naive. We still re- remain naive in some of these. This was on the last record. Do you still feel that way, or are you guys... Uh, <laughs> grizzled veterans who 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 have a real command of this gig at this point, who know how to do this. Well, I mean, uh, we're grizzled and naive, if that's possible. I mean, every show is a, is brand new. Every show is the first time, uh, I think. And I think we approach it like that, you know. Um, I think we really rely on Johnny, you know. He's a great drummer, and I think he's sort of the heart and soul of the band. And... Um, you know, I think that makes it, uh, that's how we know what to do. And I think I informed the crowd, la- well, maybe it wasn't last night, but the other day, if you're confused or a bit frightened, you know, just watch Johnny and you'll be fine. And um, I don't think that answers your question, but I don't, I don't, uh, naive, I don't know. Hmm. I haven't talked to you since your band was honored in Kingston with a, a street of your own. Mm. the tragically hip way. Do you hang out there at 2 o'clock in the morning and take photos next to the sign for Facebook? Uh, um, no. <laughs> no, no. I drove down it the other day uh, in the summertime with my a uh, couple of my kids were in the car, and it just happened to be we were at the stop sign, and Laura uh, said, you know, there's tragically hip way. And they were cool, you know. <laughs> but, it, was, it was a great honor, I would imagine. Well, yeah. Kingston City Council voted seven to six for it. <laughs> Do I have to say anything else? <clears throat> We'd oh. like to honor you with a debate of your worth for six months and then a close nail-biting council vote. I'm sorry I had to say that, but that's that. That's, that's uh, fantastic. And yet, you know, not unlike the Summit Series... You came out with the win mm-hmm. by a goal. <laughs> well, Espo um, says he wouldn't do it if he had to do it all over again. He said, and I wouldn't do it. So I don't feel so bad. Uh, um, is there something, These are, see, these, I'm sorry, these are the amorphous grand questions one asks at the end of an interview. I, is there something you would say that Tragically Hip are still searching for 30 years together? Mm, Xi'an, that is amorphous and grand. <laughs> oh... But it's a serious question, you I know. I know, I know. Five guys get together and want to take on the world, and what does that mean three decades in? Well, I mean, you just you conjure up the Richard Manuel last one. I just want to break even. <laughs> you know, that was a pretty bad Richard Manuel impersonation, but it's early. But, um, you know, it's just, it's so, um, we've been through so many things, and uh, we will continue to, and... We love making music, and I feel like we're, we're really, we like the challenge. Again, we just, more than the expectation, we still, there's a, we know that, uh, you know, as Legs McNeil would say, that hip can never be a mass movement, you know? And, uh, and that seems very punk rock to me, and ultimately that's where my heart lies, in those kinds of uh, sensations, you know, and everything that, that, you know, punk taught us. Don't do heroin. <clears throat> Don't get in small aircraft. But uh, anyway, yeah. It's a great honor to have you here, man. I know you don't do a lot of these things, and, and you agreed to come in here and, and, and do this for an hour, and, and uh, it's a really it's another uh, great Tragically Hip mm. record, and it's such a pleasure. Thank you well, so much. The for honor's mine. John, you do great work. Everybody knows it. <laughs>